All right, so this morning I'm doing the third part of a series <clears throat> called Ask It that we allow you to submit questions, and I do my best to answer those questions about the Bible, our faith, our culture, and you guys have done a great job. I'm still taking questions. There are cards in the uh, card pocket in front of you. Uh, you can send me an email, which is what a lot of people do as well. If you have a, a question uh, that maybe it's kind of been rolling around in your head, I'd love the opportunity, if possible, to answer that. So the last couple of weeks, we've, we've uh, walked through these questions. Is it wrong for Christians to have tattoos? Do you believe in soulmates? There was a question about public uh, gifts of the Spirit in the service. Uh, isn't religion just a comfort for people who are afraid to talk about or deal with death? Uh, last week, we talked about teenagers preparing them for adulthood. We talked about the question, is it true? Parts of the Old Testament, specifically the story of Noah, were copied from older writings. We talked about that. And then the last question was about suicide suicide and, uh, you know, uh, just kind of some of the theology and thinking on on suicide. So that's what uh, that's what we've done done so far. I'll be so glad when this series is over with. I just want you to know that. So, uh, all right. First question this morning. I'm facing a hard time financially. Is bankruptcy a sin? All right. So I want to say just quickly, and I want to kind of qualify this just a little bit, the, the, the answer quickly is no. There is no equivalent, you know, scriptural equivalent of bankruptcy or default. It didn't exist uh, at that particular time, but the scriptures do tell us a few things about money and the and its influence, and, and that can help shape our understanding just a little bit about this topic. So Romans 13.8 says, let no debt remain outstanding. So debts occurred even in the times of Jesus. And this passage just tells us that we should be able to pay our debts in a timely manner, that they shouldn't go overdue. So that that's kind of a, uh, can kind of give us some wisdom on, on that. Let no debt remain outstanding. Ecclesiastes 5.10 says, whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. So it talks about this creeping internal pressure to always look for something else, uh, you know, that maybe we see on on TV or social media or look at uh, what other people have in their lives and want more and more. And it says it's never, it's never satisfied. So covetousness is underestimated concerning its influence on our spending habits and our money. We're never satisfied, it says. We're always wanting, we're always wanting more. And, and when that becomes part of our life, credit can enable us that that kind of uh, that that desire credit credit enables us to make those decisions and sometimes it's not wise. Hebrews thirteen says, "Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have." So contentment today does not mean that there'll never be a time that you could never, you know, improve yourself financially or upgrade, you know, your lifestyle. It just means be happy where you're at right now. Once things, you know, if things change financially, if there's a raise or something like that, then of course you can walk into the, the blessings of the Lord. But it just, you know, it just says be content with God's blessing. And when you're content, you will not be driven by covetousness. If it happens, it happens. So let your lifestyle match your income. There's no shame in that at all, especially if you're Young, young people feel a great pressure very quickly to attain, you know, the standard of living of their parents or others. And I just say, be patient. It will, it will happen to you. But let your lifestyle match your income. Do I need a budget? That's up to you. That's up to you how you want to do that. But I go, the easy budget is what do you make on a monthly basis? Don't spend more than that. There, there's your budget, okay, very, very easily. And if, if your income changes, so can, so can your lifestyle. So let your lifestyle match your income. Pay your debts on time, okay? It's a good, good goal. If you're behind on your bills, don't be upset when creditors call you. 
They don't know your intention. Don't be rude. Don't be rude. Don't be snippy. Followers of Jesus, don't be, don't, don't be rude, you know, because they, they don't know what's going on. So take the initiative, communicate, and you might find a little grace with that. As far as the question on bankruptcy, there, there are different kinds as well. Some types of bankruptcy allow you legal protection while you kind of reorganize your finances and come up with a plan to pay it back. So, you know, there's a little gray area on that question. Others, other forms of bankruptcy are more a default, and that would probably, you know, lend itself to being, you know, a little more adverse to what the Scripture says. So whether it's a sin or not, you know, I, I don't have scriptural clarity on that, but the Scripture, you know, it does show, if you're considering this, that there are some issues about money and spending. Now, I want to I say this, too. Uh, there are some times that people are laid off long-term. They have long-term medical issues, and there are financial repercussions because of that. You know, so uh, I, I want, and, and you use the protection of bankruptcy laws in this, in this incident. So I just, I just want to say, too, that, that not every issue of spending comes with unwise spending or, you know, uh, careless spending. Sometimes, sometimes there are other life circumstances as well. So I just don't want to assume all, all financial issues are, are, are because of that. Last thing I want to say on this is get your financial house in order, okay? It needs to be a priority. It needs to be a priority. Don't let these things just linger and think that they will just correct themselves on their own. You've got to own this moment. And I want to, I want to say this. I want you to I want you to pay attention to what, what I'm saying too, all right? I think this needs to be a priority. There are a lot of things going on in the world right now that are ominous, you know, economically. There could be a war break out in the Middle East, and I promise you, I promise you it would have impacts here. I, it's as, it's as uh, you, know, as, uh, you know, intense over there as I've ever seen it in a long time, all right? We have a an election coming up and the aftermath of that and who, who knows what that will mean to us uh, economically. Uh, we have a, a, a government, you know, that uh, spends, spends, spends. We have a trillion dollars in interest. We don't have political parties or candidates that want to deal with this at all. And eventually, the bill is going to come due to the United States of America. Okay, so I'm just saying, I'm just saying to you, make it a priority. Get your financial house in order. Reduce debt. Save money. Spend wisely. That's my, you know, that's my, uh, my, my word to you. My word to you this morning. All right. Second question. Second question. Are Jewish people automatically granted immunity and go straight to heaven because they're God's chosen people, even though they don't believe Jesus is the Messiah? So I'll, I want to walk through some information in that, in that question, and then I'll, 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 I'll talk to, about the answer. So we believe, we believe God established a covenant with the Jewish people and gave them the land of Canaan as well. Genesis 17. I will establish my covenant. And this is what he says, God says to Abraham. Uh, I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan, where you are now, an alien, I will give you as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. And as for you, you must keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you, for generations to come. So we, we believe that the Lord gave the land of Canaan and he made a covenant with the people of Israel. We use the term God's chosen people. So we believe that theologically. I want to say this as well. Because we believe that Jewish people are God's chosen people <clears throat> does not mean that we are anti-Arab or anti-Muslim. You got it? We love all people. We love all people. We pray for all people. But we do believe that God made that covenant with the Jewish people. Now, there are three reasons I'll give them to you really quickly that 
uh, Jewish people do not accept, accept Jesus as the Messiah. Okay, so why, why does that happen? I'll give them to you really quickly. They don't believe Jesus was a descendant of King David. They don't believe the genealogy of, of Matthew. So when, when it talks about the Messiah ruling on the, the throne of David forever and ever, they don't, they don't believe that Jesus fit that because they don't believe his lineage um, you know, uh, his lineage from Matthew fits that. The prophecies concerning the Messiah's arrival were not fulfilled, okay? They believe that when the Messiah comes, he'll bring peace to the, to the earth. He'll gather Jewish people in exile to the land of Israel. Israel will be restored kind of as the world center, and the, the temple of Jerusalem will be rebuilt. So they go, it wasn't done. He can't be the Messiah. I go, you're just a little premature. All of that's going to happen. It's just in the second act, okay? So I won't... I I won't go to the, the, down that road for a long time. All right. And then the third, that Jesus did not meet the Old Testament qualifications of being a prophet, scholar, and a king. Okay. So there were some things they believe the Messiah will do uh, when he comes. There's a certain pedigree, you know, that they feel like that he would come. He will come out of royalty. They'll, you know, uh, and, and, and they really have trouble with how Jesus was, you know, born you know, in, in a manger, very humbly, very poor. They would just go, that's not our Messiah. Plus, the, the incarnation is not anything that they would, you know, consider part of, of the Messiah. So that's, you know, there may be more reasons. We have Alfred here. He's the expert. I should have let him kind of talk about that. I, let me say this. We are so glad to have the Currys back with us. So we want to congrat welcome you guys. They... Uh, they are our missionaries over in the, the Holy Land, and they had to leave because things were getting dicey over there, and they just got back this week. We're glad, we're glad that you guys are here. So answer the question, there is no immunity uh, for anyone, even Jewish people. There's no immunity. There wasn't immunity for Jewish people even in, even in the Old Testament, okay? It still required Jewish people to go by the law. To submit themselves to the rituals and the ceremonies as well. So you couldn't be a Jewish person and just go, hey, I'm Jewish, so it doesn't matter what I do or how I live. So that, that you know, uh, occurred in the Old Testament, and it would be the same in the New Testament. No one, you know, no one comes to faith you know, in the Lord gets to heaven, except they come through the person of Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There's no exclusion for that. Now, what we believe, too, in Bible prophecy at the end, we believe that, you know, Ezekiel 38 and 39, kind of the end of the prophetic calendar, uh, when the armies are around Jerusalem and in Israel, we believe it's in that moment that the nation of Israel acknowledges Jesus as, as Lord and Savior and that, and that there is a, re, a repentance, a national repentance for all that will do that. But there's no exclusion. There's no immunity for anyone. That's why getting the gospel out is very, is very important. All right. Uh, next question. Next question. My question is about our faith in relation to politics, voting, and our response as believers to issues of social justice. I had a number of questions all around this topic, and I just want to take a few moments this morning and talk about it. So the question is about the interaction of believers with governmental policies, electoral policy, uh, politics, and some of the systematic problems that we have in our country. So what, what does the Bible say about our engagement as well, kind of in these areas? We are taught, what does the Bible say? We're taught to be subject to and interact peacefully with government authorities when at all possible. There was a group that lived in the time of Jesus. They were called the Essenes. They did not like the Roman occupation, and they kind of lived remotely. They did not, you know, they were kind of on their own, off the grid. They never, you know, tried to come under, you know, the, the uh, Roman authorities at the time. They thought that, you know, Rome, you know, had committed an atrocity, and they, you know, they had uh, uh, for uh, kind of... Uh, uh, taking over the Holy Land, they they had declared a holy war back on Rome. So they just just said we're gonna we're gonna sit this out. And I don't I don't think that's what the Bible teaches that we exclude ourselves at all. Romans thirteen says this. 
Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities. There is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. Those who do so will bring judgment upon themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those that do wrong. Now, before you send me an ask it question about civil disobedience, okay, I want to go back to my my statement, we are taught to be subject to and interact peacefully with the government authorities when at all possible, when at all possible, all right? Because we see there are times, like in the time of Daniel, when the government said, this is what you will worship, this is how you will worship, this is when you will worship, and Daniel said, not today, I'm not doing that. So, when it's at all possible, we need to live at peace and help and support and be part of our government. All right? The second part, we're taught to pray for those who are in authority. First Timothy says, I urge, first of all, petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and those who are in authority, that all may live peaceful and quiet lives in godliness and holiness. This is good, and it pleases God, our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, the interesting part about this passage is it was written during a time of Roman occupation. All right, so he said, even under this, you know, government that we don't even like, we want to pray for those that are in authority. So, prayer for governmental leaders and direction for our country happens regardless of party and regardless of policy. All right, doesn't matter who the president is, who the governor is, who the mayor is, who the legislative bodies are, the people of God pray for those that are in authority. And I want to remind you too, prayer is apolitical and nonpartisan. When we pray for leaders, we pray wholeheartedly for leaders. We also pray too, Lord, if there are things that are not in their lives and in their policies that are not aligned, with the Word of God and the will of God, then, Lord, bring it to pass. We, pay, we pray that as well, but we're not praying destruction on people. And I want you to remember what this passage says, too, that when we do this, it says this is good and it pleases God when we pray for our leaders. So we need to interact as much as we can. We need to pray uh, as much as we can. We are taught to cooperate with our governmental authorities. This was the example of Jesus when they said, hey, you know, uh, we owe some taxes, all right? And they, they got the taxes, you know, uh, and, 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 and Jesus said, you know, give to the government the things that are governments and give to the church or give to the Lord the things that are the Lord. So he taught, especially in taxes, our participation, okay? Now, I don't necessarily like that at all. I was trying to find an exclusion to that. I looked at the message to see if the language was a little looser and, you know, no, we, we are to cooperate with our government authorities. We are not taught to see the government as inherently evil, as our enemies, and to abstain for any kind of relationship with them. We are to obey the laws. We are to obey the traffic laws. Some of you need to ask forgiveness for the way you drove to church this morning. So, obey the laws, pay your taxes, pray for its leaders, and the best you can influence the direction of your country for righteousness. So it doesn't teach an abstinence, it, teach a co it teaches a cooperation with our government as well. So another part of the question when it comes to voting as a believer. So I... I think it's a greater responsibility uh, than just civic duty. I feel like voting is part of Christian stewardship. It's part of something that I should do as a believer. We, we as followers of Jesus, we have the opportunity to be salt and light at the ballot box as well. Our influence, our beliefs can affect the course of our country. I want to say, in, 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 we're, we're in Western democracies 
our country and others where there are unique opportunities given to shape the direction of government and its policies with our ballot. All right. Many, much of the world lives under totalitarianism or communism, and they don't have that opportunity at all. They look at in, they look with envy to Western democracies that we that we have the opportunity to have a voice, you know, in the direction of our government. So I, I just, I we want to we want to take advantage of that. So I want to encourage you as an American and as a believer to vote. All right. Uh, too many believers, for whatever reasons, they don't think it's important. They've given up on the political system for whatever. Too many believers don't vote. George Barna says probably 40 percent of Christians will not participate in the upcoming election. So I want to encourage you as an American and a believer. I think it's part of stewardship. I want to encourage you to educate yourself on the candidates and policies. Now, this takes a little time. It takes a little work. But if we're going to cast a ballot, let's don't cast a stupid ballot, all right? Let's, let's educate ourselves. Listen, if there's something that I don't understand, state or local, I call Ken Sauls. You know, it's like, Ken, what, what's going on here? Help me out. I'll give you his number after church so he can, he can help you. I want to encourage you to pay attention to state and local elections and issues as well. Listen, it's not just a national election that's coming up. There are important things state and locally coming up that we need to educate ourselves on. We have Amendment 4, an abortion amendment. We have Amendment 3, that's a, a marijuana amendment. Things like that are very important for you to read, study, and be knowledgeable about when you vote. I want to encourage you to make plans to vote on November the 3rd. And I want to tell you why. I want you to think ahead. It's a Tuesday. What am I doing that day? Now, here, here's why I said that, because it was my intention in the spring to vote in the primary. But I didn't look far enough in advance, and I was in Nicaragua on a missions trip, and I didn't get to vote. Because I didn't look far enough and go, all right, what's, what's going on, you know, on, on, that, on that particular day? So I want you to go, hey, what, you know, what's going on on that day? And if you can't Make it on that day. You can early vote in Leon County starting tomorrow. You can mail in a ballot, which is you know, normally what I do, especially if you think that Tuesday is going to be very busy and you don't want to get out. So I'm just saying look ahead, plan ahead, and vote. I also want to encourage you to pray for our country. Okay, I think we are headed, you know, the, the way that we are headed is unsustainable. Okay, I think we are headed for, you know, some kind of issue in the, in the future. We have too much debt. We have too much hate in our political system. We don't talk about character, honesty, integrity anymore. It's not a, you know, it's not a virtue in our political offices, and, and we're seeing that emerge. We are quickly becoming a godless, secular country. We are approaching Europe as a post-Christian nation and the fruit that comes from that. And I promise you, I'm going to vote. I'm going to participate. But my hope rests not in a political party or a politician. To me, the only way that our country will make a turn will be some kind of awakening, some kind of hand of God moving across this nation again. Some type of people that start calling out and, and asking God to do something in our nation again. Proverbs 28.2 says, when there is moral rot within a nation, the government topples easily. All right? But when wise and knowledgeable leaders, but with wise and knowledgeable leaders, they bring stability. So I want to encourage, you know, your, your interaction in faith and in politics. And then there was also another part of the question that talked about kind of our interaction with issues of social justice as well, our response as believers to issues of social justice. Social justice is an issue, and I mean a phrase that's, that kind of has understanding in the church and the secular world. It was Jesus who was our greatest example that went to the broken and the at risk. He went to the leper. He, he went to the woman at the well. He, he was, uh, you know, had heart for the poor, teaching on the poor. He broke down racial stereotypes as well. 
he, he introduces himself in Luke 4 with this introduction. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because He's anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners, the recovery of sight to the blind, and to set the oppressed free. So the followers of Jesus are encouraged to, to read what He said. And man, this is the field that we work. This is the, the type people. We're not out just for the rich and those that have it all together. He said, these are the people that I'm that I'm going to. James 2, what, what is our interaction with this? What is our role? James 2 says this, What good is it, my brother, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm and well and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? He rebukes just the acknowledgement of the problem. He says to the people, hey, don't just wave at them. Don't just wave at them. He rebukes that. He says, get involved in some way. If they need clothes, if they need food. So he's teaching interaction on issues of, of social justice as well. The Good Samaritan didn't offer a quiet, silent prayer on the other side of the road. He got involved with someone that was hurting. He took his own money and his own, his own time. So we're not taught just to be separate and acknowledge and pray. We're, we're taught when, on issues of, of social justice to be involved with that. The gospel calls the believers of this world to action on behalf of the at risk, the poor, the abused, and the forgotten. And I want to mention a couple of these as well. Human trafficking. Human trafficking is the exploitation of a person through force, fraud, or coercion. Most of the time, they are women and children. And this this problem is, you know, is worldwide and it's local. If you haven't seen the movie Sound of Freedom, I want to encourage you to see it. Okay, it's a true story about trafficking around the world. And I want to tell you, like, you, it will make you sick, but it will, it will awaken you as well to kind of the, the worldwide issue concerning human trafficking. But we're not exempt from it here in Florida as well. Florida is the third highest state for human trafficking cases with over 2,100 reported cases in 2023, a majority of them involving children. Okay, so we're, we're not exempt to this. We're the third, the third highest state in this area. Sex trafficking is the predominant form of human trafficking in Florida. Okay, in Leon County. Human trafficking is on the rise, and we're seeing we're, it's raising its ugly head now more than ever before. Our city has created a human trafficking task force because of this emerging issue that we had. And I just want to celebrate, just a couple of months ago, we had a trafficked individual here, and some of our local organizations were able to help and, and bring freedom, and, and uh, our pregnancy centers as well are seeing more trafficking cases as well. So I don't want us to think that we're just immune to this at all. And, but one thing that we face here, like, like locally, is that local, local women selling their bodies just to pay bills or to pay for addictions, okay? That, that's kind of what, what we see, women that are in that, you know, that are making the choice because of that. Because where there's economic disparity with at-risk women, there is usually trafficking that follows. So we want to be there as much as we can. So our church, we're not just sitting by, waving and praying. We want to raise awareness for human trafficking in, in our church and in our community. We partner with Christians Against Trafficking. Kelsey Quinn sits on their board. And with, we partner also financially with other local prevention programs. We are involved at Hope Community. You just saw, you know, we're, we'll be there tomorrow feeding. And we'll be to, there tomorrow working with those kids that are there because when there's economic economic disparity and at risk you know women normally there's trafficking there so human trafficking we want to be you know kind of kind of be there there are other parts of social justice the poor hungry widow 
orphan, an immigrant. The gospel calls the wealthy of this world on behalf, on, to action on behalf of the poor. Proverbs 21 says, whoever shuts their ear to the cry of the poor will also cry out and not be answered. So we pay attention here to the poor and the homeless, those with security issues. Leon County has 30,000 people that live in our county that have food insecurity issues. We are happy to be part of that as much as we can. A couple of weeks ago, Street Hope, who's been around for almost, you know, 10 years, they fed 80 people in one setting. They clothed and fed them. So I want you to know that That is not an issue that's somewhere else. That's an issue that's right here. We are doing what what we can to to help the poor and the homeless. And also inflation. Everyone has felt inflation. All right. So that is, is, you know, made those that are kind of on the brink, you know, financially. That's made it much more difficulty. And that's where you see the the food scarcity numbers uh, arise. Last social justice issue that I want to mention this morning is abortion. Because to me, it's a biblical issue. It's a biblical social justice issue. It's not just an issue of policies, policy and politics. It's been pulled over there. It's been pulled over there. But literally, it is an issue of life and death. All right? And I just want to, I just want to say just, just very clearly, with, with love in our hearts and steadfast determination in our minds. We stand with those who cannot defend themselves and we speak on behalf of those that have no voice and that will be the stand of the church. It's the stand of our church. Now, I realize, you know, especially if you're younger, you know, uh, maybe you think differently on this and I want you to hear just some of the things that I'm going to say Uh, This morning, and I'll do it respectfully, and I'll do it civilly this morning. You know, what does God's Word say as believers? What's the theology of life? Where do we kind of get this? Are we just trying to be, you know, uh, political here? No. Long before abortion was ever a thing, there was the theology of life in God's Word that was the underpinning long before this this act ever, you know, ever occurred. So, uh, So the Scriptures teach, let me give you the theology of life. The scriptures teach that we're made in the image of God. What is in the womb? Is it just a collection of cells, embryo, fetus, or is there more? We believe that there is an intrinsic human value given by God uh, with worth to human life. I think we've got some images that we want to scroll as well. Genesis 1, let us make... Let us make mankind in our image and in our likeness. So God created mankind in his own image, and in the image of God he created them, and he created them male and female. His stamp is upon us. We are created in in his likeness, human form. And that is very significant in this in this conversations. The, teach, the scriptures teach that even in the womb, we are known by God, and he has a unique purpose for each one of us. Psalms 139. You created me in my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was made in the secret place, I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days were ordained for me, were written in your book before one of them came to be. At conception, we are known by God. He has a plan and a purpose, a destiny and a future. We are not the product of biological randomness. Human life at conception should be connected with personhood in the moment that it, that it is conceived. And we believe that God, has do, God does that. The scriptures teach that humans are created uniquely above all others. Spirit, mind and body. Not just a physical creation. All right. But, but unique soul and spirit that will live on together on a different level than than the animal than the animal creation not just a body but an eternal spirit with power to make volitional decisions and the scriptures show also the value of human life 
when, and when there is punishment required, there is punishment required when human life is taken, okay? So thou shalt not kill. God places a value on human life. Murder and punishments, you know, when people murder, there's a punishment that come because life has, life is sacred. So our society has validated those beliefs, you know, in the, in the, the value of, 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 of human uh, humanity because of the penalty that's placed upon it when that is violated. So we, we feel like there should be a consistency there. If you respect life outside the womb, then it needs to be respected inside the womb. I'm good on those pictures. I want to mention a few other things. All right. The actual act of abortion is brutal, cruel, inhumane, Barbaric in many ways, all right? Little babies aren't just floating away here. It's in utero dismemberment, and it's worse form, all right? It's awful. It's awful what happens. It's, it's barbaric, all right? Abortions are, in the U.S., are disproportionately African-American, Abortions around the world are disproportionately female, especially in other parts of the world. If there's a, 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 a little girl, you know, especially in, like in China, uh, it's just awful. There are emotional and psychological effects on women, including guilt, decrease in self-esteem, and regret. You don't hear a lot about this. You know, you just see, like, people go have this, and then, man, they just move on with their life. But I'm just telling you, the bond between mom and child is much greater than just kind of some, some medical act, you know, in a clinic somewhere. There's a, there's a greater connection with that. Now, you won't hear that a lot. They just say you pay your money and you move on. But I'm just telling you, there are many, many young women that, that you know, are, that deal with kind of regret and, and they have long-term kind of emotional issues after this is over with. So it's not just as clean as your politicians will, will tell you. They deal with this. They deal with this. They deal with this long-term. I want to say we are a house of grace, all right? We stand for life. We will. We always will. I want to say this. If you're a young person, all right, and you ever find yourself in this place, I want you to know that our church is a house of grace, all right? Now, let me say to the church, first of all, we want to be very careful because even though in our intensity and, and the passion that we are pro-life, we want to be careful that we don't set a tone to others that if there's something that happens unfortunate in the church that they never could come to the church, because everyone would be angry. Everyone would be upset, okay? So we want to be careful in our tone how we deal with this. I want to say, if you're a young person and you find yourself kind of uh, in, uh, in an unplanned pregnancy, all right, I want you to know this is a house of grace. You won't be kicked out. You won't be, you won't be shamed in any way, you know. We will help you. We will pray for you. We will love you. We will give you a baby shower just like we give to every, every baby. We'll, we'll dedicate that little baby like we did this morning. I don't want you to ever think the church would be angry with me, so I need to go hide. I need to do something else. If it's in your heart to have that little child, you have that little child, and this place will love and embrace you and will love and take care of that little baby. <clears throat> And I promise you, there's some ladies back in that nursery that cannot wait to get their hands on that baby. I promise you that. They love babies. Sometimes, you, especially when you're young and you're by yourself, you may feel like, I can't do this financially. I, I can't. I couldn't make it. I, I promise you, we will help. There are resources out there. Most of the abortions happen with young girls in their early 20s. Part of that is because they feel like they, there's no financial alternative. I want you to know if that is in your heart, this church will help you. You have that baby. We will stand with you before and after as well. I promise you that. 
But even, even if you don't think you can handle it, man, there's, there's wonderful uh, opportunities for adoption as well, you know, that, that, that can happen, that can find themselves in a family that, that loves and cares for them. I want to say, too, if you're out there today and go, man, how can, I, how can I help? Well, maybe if you considered opening your heart and your home for fostering. I mean, if we're encouraging, you know, hey, have these babies, then there may be a, a bigger answer, you know, to, to this. If they're going to be women, they're going to have babies, then maybe fostering is an opportunity that you can open your heart and that you can open your home. We have GC families here that works in foster care ministry as well. So uh, uh, we want you to know that we'll, there, that we'll be there. Last question. Last question. And it won't take but a moment. I'm pretty sure God has forgiven me, but I'm having trouble forgiving myself. Please help me. You'd be surprised how many times I have this conversation with people. Just, just be surprised. You know, like I always think, man, forgiveness of sin and shame is always kind of, you know, one and the same. And it's, it's not. You know, it, it, it's not. It, but maybe that's because my life experience is just a little bit different. I got saved when I was in high school, okay? The worst thing I did, okay, I got suspended three times in high school, okay? Once for being late for school, two, the, the other two things are under the blood. Do not even ask me about it. I got three tickets in high school, all right? One ticket, I had three violations, I was speeding, I ran a stop sign, and I was driving without shoes. When did they change that law? I just thought everyone did that. So I got saved early, so maybe it's easier for me to think, you know, I didn't have really kind of big things. Maybe it was kind of easier for me to think that when God forgives, that there's no, there's no shame, you don't struggle with that, you know, you don't struggle with that at all. But I realize two, that sometimes people have deep sins. They've hurt others, been in jail, and they're struggling, moving on, you know, with their, with their life and with their faith. Worship team, you can come, you know. Uh, on the cross, on the cross, Jesus died for our sin, and as part of that, he took our shame. He took our shame. It's one it's one and the same, okay? Now, people get embarrassed sometimes by things that they've done, and I, I, I understand that as I get a little older, that people take ownership of what they've done, and I appreciate that. Sometimes people, when they, when they, when they talk about forgiveness, man, it doesn't even bother them what they've done. They just kind of fly through straight to forgiveness, and they never really, you know, go through the, the process of repentance and sorrow over what they've done to others and done with God. But there are people that, that realize what they've done, the weight of what they've, the weight of what they've done, and they take, they take ownership of that as well. So I, I understand that. But I want you to understand, as far as the cross, he can't take your sin and not your shame. He took your sin, and he takes your shame as well. Shame keeps us from fully walking in God's forgiveness, okay? We always think in our mind that there's some qualification. He forgives those, but man, these big things I'm really struggling with. I just can't, I can't get over it. It keeps me from walking in the fullness of forgiveness. Shame Wants us to keep, keep silent, all right? Hey, don't, don't say anything to anyone. We'll, we'll just kind of get over this later. Don't say anything to the church. People in the church, just, just be quiet. Kind of work through this on your own. What, I mean, what if the church knew? I would say, <laughs> do you know where you're going to church? There's some rough folks out there. They've done some stupid things in their life. And everybody that's done something stupid in their life would just shout a good amen. Yeah. There's no perfect people here. You don't have to hide here. You don't have to be ashamed of what you've done here. I promise you anything that's, that's done has been done before. I think that's why I love this church. 
Because we don't come out of perfect homes. We don't come out of perfect backgrounds. We haven't all made perfect decisions. We've made messes of our lives. We've done things that were wrong. We've broken God's heart. We've broken family's heart. We've broken the law. But you know what? There's one thing that unites us that regardless of the differences of our sin, that we found hope, restoration, forgiveness, and peace through Jesus Christ. Shame keeps us from fully walking in God's grace. When I'm embarrassed, when I haven't, when I can't move on from that, it stunts our spiritual growth. You know, there's no progression in our spiritual life because we're so tied back to what I've done and what I've used to be. It doesn't release us to walk in the fullness of what God has. Shame keeps us from the plan and destiny God has for us. You look around on Sunday morning and you see people with their hands raised and you see people in in ministry and you go, man, I could never do that. I can't worship that way. I'll never be able to serve. I'll never be able to do this because of that. I'm just telling you, you're wrong. You're paying again for a sin that God's already taken care of. He's taken away your sin. He knows what you did. And in the midst of that, he said, I still love you. I still forgive you. And if I forgive you, I'm not just going to hold you down the rest of your life. But was that when there is forgiveness, there is freedom to walk into his destiny. You don't have to live in shame. Here's what Hebrews 9 says. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that led to death so that we may serve the living God. He said part of this regeneration effort is that he can cleanse that conscience. When you still feel guilty before God, he can cleanse that. I want to tell you, there is freedom for some of you today if you'll let that shame go. We always take ownership. We always go, hey, I blew it. It's part of my testimony. I know that I've done wrong. I know that I I should have done something different. But in the midst of that, in the midst of that, I acknowledge what I've done wrong. It's part of my repentance. But I accept fully the free gift of grace that God has given me. And I truly believe through the work of the cross of Jesus Christ that He has forgiven my sins. He has restored me. He's taken my shame. Even though I know that it was wrong, I'm going to walk in the freedom that was provided by Jesus Christ on the cross. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. So if you struggle with the past, you struggle with shame, I'm telling you, that, that's already been taken care of at the cross. When you go, hey, Lord, I, I'm still struggling with this. He goes, what are you talking about? I don't even know what you're talking about. I want to say to you this morning, move on. Walk forward in God's grace. Don't look back to what's happened in the past. Be thankful for what He's done in your life today and go in the grace of God. Would you stand this morning? Would you stand this morning? Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. If you're thankful for God's grace in your life, would you just take a moment and give Him praise this morning? Would you just thank Him? Across the building. If you're one of those that, that knew better, you knew what, you made stupid decisions, you've broken, you, you've broken God's law, would you just take a moment and just say, thank you, Lord, for your forgiveness. Thank you, Lord, for your forgiveness. Lord, I was broken. I was destitute. Lord, thank you for your forgiveness. And Jesus taught that the worship and the experience with grace is a little sweeter if the sin was a little more intense. For those that have been given much, they love much. My teenage life, I couldn't really appreciate God's grace because my sins were a little smaller. But man, some of you have walked in some big things and the Lord said in His Word, I'm going to give you a greater appreciation for grace. Your worship is going to be sweeter because of that. So this morning we're going to close. I want to I pray 
And if you're here today, maybe you've got some things in your life that are unsettled with the Lord. Maybe there's some things that you need to make right with God. Today is your day. Your day of forgiveness, your day of transformation can happen. Maybe you're here today. And man, you struggle a little bit with the past. There are things that you can't get over. There are things that you can't get past. It's affecting who you are and your walk with God now. Today's your day. Today's your day. Today's your day. The worship team's going to sing. And if that's you this morning, I'm going to open these altars. I'm going to give you the opportunity to come. You can find forgiveness or we're going to pray that there'll be a final release to shame and embarrassment. We're going to give that over to the Lord what has bothered you and hindered you before we're going to leave at the altar and let you walk in the fullness of the Lord those that are up front maybe you're here this morning I just want to pray that prayer of forgiveness today if you're struggling if you're away from God if you feel like your sin separates it doesn't it doesn't it's an invitation to God's God's presence so Lord I pray across this building today Lord if people think I've done too much I've gone too far Lord, I pray as they reach out to you this morning, I pray that there'll be forgiveness provided at the cross of Jesus. Lord, as they call out to you, Lord, let there be a wave of God's grace this morning, a wave of God's forgiveness this morning, Lord, that speaks to heart and that cleanses you. You tell us you cleanse our conscious, our conscious thoughts, Lord, our consciousness. Lord, we pray, we stand on that today. Lord, I pray you'll do a work of forgiveness. Lord, you'll forgive every sin. The blood of Jesus, Lord, wipe it clean. I pray for those who are struggling this morning, who have things that they're past that they just haven't seen to cut that tie on. Lord, they still feel guilty when they are in your presence. Lord, I pray today, Lord, for a work of grace. A work of release, Lord. The enemy would continually attach us to our past. But Lord, we are free. Who the Son set free is free indeed. That is sin and shame. And Lord, I pray, I pray, Lord, people will walk in fullness. They'll walk in grace. Lord, they're going to they're gonna have a new worship, a song of worship. Lord, they're going to be released to serve you in new ways because they're putting... Uh, unforgiveness and shame behind. Lord, I pray over that today. I pray over that today. I pray today is a day of freedom, Lord. A day of freedom, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Megan, sing that again. Not for a minute. I've been forsaken. Not for a Thank minute. Thank you, Lord. Sing it. Sing it. Sing it. Sing it.